G'day ladies and gents and welcome back to Mags TV and yes it's time to talk about an aircraft that has been discussed a lot over the years amongst my community and the greater War Thunder community as well. The high speed 262 prototypes, the HG1, HG2 and the HG3. Today we'll be flying out the HG2 and it will be the focus of most of this video. The background gameplay today is from IL-2 Stromovic 1946, a fantastic simulation even if it is showing its age a little these days. The mission I am flying is a runway defense mission in which two flights of eight HG2s are to take off and intercept a flight of Russian bombers and their escort. I am part of the first flight that will deal with the bombers, the second squadron will deal with the escorts that include Soviet Yak-15s and MiG-9s. But anyways, for those who may not know, what are the HG prototypes? Well, in short, they were a series of proposed test designs intended to produce a high-speed replacement for the production 262. While the 262 was the world's first production jet fighter and an incredibly advanced design for the time, it was not flawless. In fact, from a design standpoint, it had many problems. First was the wing sweep and engine pods. The original 262 design was to include the engines in the wing routes for improved aerodynamics. However, due to delays in the engine's production, it was decided to move the engines out onto the wings in pods. This was so that the airframe construction could be completed and engine fitting could be done at a later time, preventing further delays. And as it turned out, this was a really good idea, as the engine pods made maintenance on the extremely issue-prone Jumo 004 engines much easier. The wing sweep was another issue. The original 262 design proposed a standard wing design with a sweep of around 10 degrees. Once the first set of engines became available, this was changed as it was found that the engines were heavier than expected. As a result, they needed to be moved back in order to preserve the center of balance for the aircraft, and as a result, the 262 received its 18.5 degree wing sweep that we know today. However, 18.5 degrees is not enough of a sweep to have a major effect on the critical Mach number of an aircraft like the 262. The wing sweep here was added for aircraft balance only and not speed. The result was the 262 struggled at speeds over Mach 0.80 and could suffer critical control loss at speeds over Mach 0.86. The last issues came from the fuselage itself. Although very aerodynamic for the time, the 262 suffered many issues in the production fuselage. First was the high mounted cockpit and the wide body. Both of these are throwbacks to the original intention of wing route mounted engines, with the wide body allowing for their fitting and the high cockpit allowing for the pilot to safely sit above them. Both of these caused excessive and unnecessary drag on the airframe. And the last of all was the finish itself. The 262s appear very smooth in old photographs, but in actual fact they were quite rough to touch with extremely high surface drag. Adolf Boosman, a German aerospace engineer specializing in aerodynamics and supersonic airflows, understood this, and even after the 262 went into production, he continued to develop high-speed designs. Efforts that would find him moving to the United States and becoming a researcher for the NACA, or National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, a federal agency that just a few years later would dissolve and become part of a much more well-known agency, NASA. His research produced three design proposals for improvements to the standard ME262. First was the HG-1. The HG-1 was the only one of the three to ever be constructed and flight tested. It consisted of a standard ME262A1 airframe with the standard Jumo 004 engines. However, the body was polished smooth, the engine nacelles were redesigned for improved aerodynamic flow, and leading edge extensions were added to the interior third of both wings, increasing the inner wing sweep up until the engines to 35 degrees. The cockpit was also lowered, streamlining the body even more. This was the simplest design and intended as a possible refit to the production 262, however, testing showed the aircraft continued to suffer problems on approach to Mach 0.86, and no attempt was ever made to exceed it, although it was noted that aircraft acceleration was improved. The second design was the HG-2, which we see here. The HG-2 included some radical design changes. Firstly, the wings were swept back at 35 degrees. This is the same wing sweep as the MiG-15 Biz and the F-86 Sabre, which would come much later after the war. The engine pods were streamlined, as with the HG-1, but were moved closer to the wing route. While maintaining the same dimensions, the fuselage surface area was reduced by lowering the curvature of the body, and it was polished smooth, and as with the HG-1, the cockpit was also streamlined into the body. In an effort to lower drag even more, the standard tail was replaced with a butterfly or V-tail. 
This design has the elevators placed at a 45 degree angle, having them work together as both elevator and rudder, allowing for the removal of the large vertical stabiliser, and with it, the drag it generates. Of course, butterfly tails have a collection of issues of their own. They are unstable at low speeds, will introduce a slight yawing movements during pitching manoeuvres, and will introduce slight pitching movements during yaw manoeuvres, making them both difficult to keep pointed at a target, as you would need for aiming guns in a fighter, and the combination of these two also makes V-tailed aircraft very difficult to land. That said, the HG2 did have a small-scale model built for wind tunnel testing and was projected to have a critical Mach number of about 0.93 at 6,000 metres. The HG3 was the most radical design of the three and as such really needs a video on its own at a later time. However, in short, its engines will move back into the totally redesigned fuselage, its wings were redesigned to feature a 45 degree wing sweep, and while it featured a standard inverted T-tail design, the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer was also at 45 degrees. The HG3 design had a projected critical Mach number of 0.96 at 6,000 meters, or around 1,092 kilometers an hour, making it theoretically the fastest of the three designs. However, it was never tested in any form of paper, and both the HG1 prototype and the HG2 scale model were destroyed in Allied bombing raids towards the end of the war. So, let's talk War Thunder for just a moment. The HG2 is a plane that tends to be a very popular request, as at one time it was actually on the War Thunder future release list for aircraft on the official website before they were removed. As to if there are any plans to add it to the game now, I can honestly say I have no idea, but if we were to build a performance stack card for such an aircraft, what would it look like? Now, to be clear before we go into this, the HG2 was a paper design with only a small amount of scale model testing having been done. I will do my best to pull the projected historical numbers out for the most part on this, but some of this is going to have to be down to educated guesses. But I'll cover exactly how I'm going through this as we go through. So first up, let's talk speed. The HG2 had a projected critical Mach number of 0.93 at 6,000 meters. This one is pretty simple to convert and comes out at a maximum speed of 1,058.34 km per hour at an altitude of 6,000 meters or around 20,000 feet. So the HG2 was not a slow aircraft by any means, but not quite up to the speeds of the Sabre or the MiG-15 and 17 either. Now I haven't been able to find any mention for a projected maximum altitude for the HG2, however the aircraft was intended to use an improved version of the Jumo engine. Now, while improve would mean more thrust and more reliable operation, I doubt that the maximum operational altitudes would have increased. So I'm going to play it on the safe side here and assume that the maximum operational altitude would be the same as the standard 262A1, so around 12,500 meters or 41,000 feet. Next up we should consider rate of climb, and thankfully no calculation is needed here, there is a projection for this. The HG2's rate of climb was projected to be at around 25 meters per second or around 4,900 feet per minute, which is quite a decent rate of climb, comparable to a number of post-war and early Korean War jet designs. Next up we come to turn time. Now, we have two areas to consider here. First is the flat turn speed, which is what War Thunder uses for its stack cards, and then a general estimate of combat maneuverability. So, there are a lot of numbers here that we simply don't have, so in some cases I'm just going to have to use a logical guess. So first the flat rate. The flat rate turns are all about speed, stall speed and control. The only number that we have here is the stall speed, which was estimated to be the same as the standard 262A1, with a stalling speed of around 202 km per hour with a full load of fuel flaps and gear down. Despite the change to the butterfly tail and the increased wing sweep, the stall speed was expected to be about the same, as while that sweep was increased, the actual wing surface area remained the same. Following this line of thought, you would expect the HG2 to have a similar flat turn ability, so estimated turning time at around 28 to 30 seconds. In combat maneuverability is much more difficult to put hard numbers on without some level of testing, but we can make some assumptions based on our knowledge of the particulars of the design. First is the engine placement. Pulling the engines back towards the fuselage in the HG2 would have moved the weight distribution of the aircraft more towards the centre. That coupled with the removal of the lateral drag created by the large vertical stabiliser would likely have resulted in the HG2 having a noticeably higher roll rate than the A1. However, the swept wings coupled with the inherent problems of the butterfly tail design I would expect the HG2's combat turning ability to be far lower, especially in hard pitch manoeuvres. 
So overall, the HG-2 would be a comparable aircraft to the F-9, F-6 Cougar in terms of maximum speed and maneuverability, however with a much lower climb rate. From an historical standpoint, should the war have gone on just a year or so longer and the HG-2 had been produced, it would have been outright the single fastest fighter of its time, easily outperforming the American's P-80 Shooting Star and the British Meteor in regards to speed, the ultimate boom and zoom fighter. However, the HG-2 design does have one massive weakness, a flaw that was almost universal to all German wartime jet designs, excluding the Horton 229. It wasn't designed with air brakes. Now this may seem like a strange thing, but a massive part of jet combat and dogfighting is speed control. Air brakes give you the ability to stay on the tail of an evasive target or to force an overshoot at will, the ability to buy a few extra seconds of gun time on a target when needed, and the ability to have a much shorter approach when landing, limiting the amount of time that you're at low speeds and vulnerable. The production 262A1 was never fitted with air brakes, and this caused it many issues in its short operational life. The HG2 design also shows no signs of air brakes ever being proposed for it. However, the aircraft it would be facing, the first generation of British jet fighters, such as the previously mentioned Meteor, and the first generation of American jet fighters, such as the P-80 Shooting Star, both had air brakes out of the factory and were designed with them from the outset. From the standpoint of War Thunder, as an aircraft that would likely have to be given a BR of around 8.0 at minimum, it would be constantly fighting aircraft that were either faster than it, more maneuverable than it, or both, with pretty much every potential enemy encounter that it could face at that BR being against an enemy with at least the advantage of air brakes. So, the ME262 HG2. From an historical standpoint, it would have been an incredible design should it have been produced, and there was nothing overly outrageous about the design preventing that. From a War Thunder standpoint, however, well, it's an aircraft that I am not against Gaijin adding, and I'm definitely not saying that it couldn't compete at a higher BR range where it would most likely need to be tiered. However, it would be an aircraft with an extremely high skill cap, constantly competing at a disadvantage, requiring an exceptional pilot to overcome its flaws. Or if not flaws, uh, weaknesses in regards to extremely powerful post-war aircraft. In either case, it is an interesting design with an even more interesting history. Anyways, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching. Please remember to click that like button and subscribe and also please take the time to check out the links to my Patreon and Discord server in the video description below. Until next time, fly smart, fly safe, and I will catch you in the skies.